Good evening. Welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. We have a full house tonight. We're going to address the topic, why are Muslims leaving Islam? This is an important topic because lots of Muslims just seem totally convinced that no one ever leaves Islam. And it's really, really silly to think that way because from the earliest Muslim sources, we find people leaving Islam left and right. Abu Bakr. Uh, Muhammad's closest companion and the first rightly guided caliph had to fight wars against entire groups of people who were leaving Islam for various reasons, and the situation is still uh, with us today. Um, so here on the show tonight, we have a couple of apostates. Uh, we have our friend C.L. Edwards with us here again. C.L. was a Muslim for about 10 years, a Salafi. Uh, looked like a total terrorist in the pictures <laughs> I saw. Uh, and CL will be sharing uh, with us tonight as we move along. We also have on Skype our good friend Farhan Qureshi. When Farhan was a Muslim, I, I forget how many debates we had. I would say probably, I don't know, five or six. We had a lot of different debates on a variety of topics, so uh, you can't, you know, there's no way you can say Farhan is making this up. But although I have seen some suggested, I have seen a couple of people suggest that this was our plan all along, that Farhan spent years debating Christians, uh, even though he's never really a Muslim, uh, in order to apostatize later on and to make uh, Islam look bad. I've seen people say that, and that shows you how, kind of how desperate uh, some people are to ignore the fact that people do actually leave Islam. It, it's actually quite common. And uh, our, uh, our friend Sam can even testify. We hear from former Muslims all the time, don't we? Don't we hear from yes, Muslims, we do. former Muslims uh, regularly? Yes, we do, actually, that have left Islam by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when we I do. say we, we hear from them, I don't mean, you know, they've been former Muslims for years and we just, you know, we, we eventually hear from them or something like that. I mean, we regularly, regularly here, uh, people saying, hey, I just left Islam. Hey, I live in India, or I live in Pakistan, or I live in the Middle East, and I want you to know, you guys, uh, from watching videos or sometimes watching this show, um, or reading articles or something like that, I realize Islam can't be true, and, uh, and I left. So we hear from former Muslims all the time. Most of them don't go, uh, most of them don't go public, and you know, that's, that's a pretty wise decision, given, to, given what could happen to them uh, in certain places. Uh, but the, our Muslim friends here tonight certainly are going public, and we're going to look at uh, some of the reasons why people leave Islam. And, and just to be clear, people can leave any position. People can leave Christianity. People can leave atheism. I left atheism. Uh, people can leave all kinds of positions, and people can do so for good reasons or for bad reasons. So people can leave Islam for bad reasons. If, if someone came to me and said, hey, I just left Islam, and I say, well, why'd you do that? And he said, uh, you know, well, I, I really wanted to eat pork. You know, I, I mean, you know, I always wanted to try ham all my life, and you know, and I wanted to try it, and I realized I have to leave Islam in order to eat pork. So, uh, so I left Islam. I, I, I wouldn't think that's a that's a very good reason. I would think that's an extreme. You know, so, even though the person left Islam, I would think, wow, that is a really, really dumb reason uh, to leave a religion. Uh, so, the, you people can leave Islam for bad reasons. Question is. Um, are some people leaving Islam for good reasons? And we're going uh, we're, we're to focus, because we've already had a show where we focus exclusively on CL, we're going to focus on getting the background from, uh, from our friend Farhan, but we're going to have uh, CL add comments throughout, and let's see how things go. If you want to call in tonight, probably not going to take calls for the first hour or so, since we have four people on the program tonight. Um, so if you want to call, call in after the first hour, and we'll try to get to as many calls as we can. So, uh, Farhan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Peace and love to you guys. God bless you. Hey, how, how's it going? And every, everyone I know of, everyone I know of uh, who knew Farhan back when he was a Muslim and, and debated with him or had dialogues with him, everyone would say Farhan was, was our, favorite, our favorite Muslim. I said that, I think, in several, in several uh, uh, public debates, just because you, you are, unlike, unlike certain other Muslims, you are really easy to get along with, and you seem to actually be thinking about the material rather than uh, you know, just, just dogmatically asserting things and never changing your views. Um, and I think part of the reason for that was even in becoming a Muslim, you had to, you had to modify what you were raised to believe. Is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I had to modify what I had, what I believed, 
or what I was taught by my parents for the first 17 years. They were taught a, a different version of Islam. And then I came to uh, Orthodox Sunni Islam and spent 10 years uh, practicing it, uh, being a mu'azin in the masjid, which means I called the adhan to the, to the prayer regularly. I recited the Qur'an. I went to the masjid regularly, praying five times a day. I spent money uh, 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 traveling, uh, time, effort. I, I dedicated a good portion of my life uh, to this religion. For, for, for a good 10 to 15 years. And uh, it was a grieving process to leave it, absolutely a grieving process to leave it. But now, you know, I think that I've reached the acceptance phase and, and I feel liberated more than ever. Yeah. Farhan, uh, while, you are, while you are a Muslim, most Muslims don't actually, actually go out and engage in public debates. Why did you want to go out and defend Islam in that way? Because you, you debated Sam Shamoon, you debated me several times, you debated... Nabil Qureshi, you debated James White, so you you debate you took on uh, you took on most of the the people who are going around uh, defending Christianity in public debate. What what why did you do that? As a, you, because most most people don't do that. So so what why did you end up doing that? Well, I mean, Islam was a it was the source of, of of my identity. It was the source of my 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 spirituality and my global brotherhood. Uh, I mean, it meant everything to me, you know what I mean? I, like I said, I did, dedicated so much time and effort praying and whatnot. And to see that that, that the source of, uh, of my identity was being challenged the way that it was, uh, I felt that it was crucial for me to not only know why, why I believe what I believe, but be able to defend it. Um, and so I was willing to do that very passionately. And, and I had the opportunity to, to do that w w with you guys. And not only that, but it helped me to challenge my own beliefs. And you guys helped me to challenge my own beliefs. Uh, you guys exposed me to some information I was not aware of uh, that, that got me to think harder. And, 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 um, and the process just went along the way that it did. Did, uh, did, did anything from, from those actual debates, because you... you, you... And I, I noticed this a long time ago. Uh, you, you seem to be a little bit different in the debates, in that you're uh, you're regarding the actual debates as a kind of as a kind of learning process in preparing for the debates and engaging the debates. Lots of people are already convinced when they're walking into a debate. They're already completely convinced. Uh, the other person's arguments are, you know, just the other person's ammunition in, in this battle. Whereas, you know, you seem to, you know, to regard this as as, as an opportunity. Uh, for learning, uh, what did you? How much did you learn from from the actual debates? What what kind of things were there that that uh, that kind of messed with your mind a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, going back to the Ahmadi Dr. Zakir Naik era, you know, when 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 there was not a lot of information out about Islam, you know, you had these these websites, but in terms of you know, something that you could listen to, uh, you know, material that you could read. There wasn't a lot of material out there. Now, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely convinced that Islam was the ultimate reality behind our existence. I passionately believed it, and I was willing to defend it. But I, I think my open-mindedness had a lot to do, you know, j just being an American, being exposed to diversity and plurality from the get-go, you know, having a Western education, um, and falling in love with it, falling in love with, with America and, and the diversity and plurality here. And so it helped me to, to, to be a little bit more open-minded, uh, I think, rather than, you know, being protected extremely, you know, by, by rigid parents who, if you don't believe and practice our religion, um, you know, th th that you're going to be, you know, th that we're going to hurt you and abandon you and that kind of thing. So being born and raised in America helped a lot, but don't get me wrong, I was passionately a Muslim and I was convinced. But, but the debate format was an opportunity for me to look at I information and know why I believe what I believe um, and, and defend it as well. I mean, I was, I was definitely practicing what, what's known in psychology as confirmation bias, which means that even if David or, or Sam or any of these guys or William Lane Craig in his epic debates with Shabir Ali, which I was being, first, which I was being exposed to the, for the first time since the D. Zakir Naik era, uh, you know, that, that he still had a response, you know what I mean? Even if the response made no sense whatsoever, the response was there. And I, and I was willing to use what we call in psychology confirmation bias and just, you know, look for the information that confirmed my, my, my belief as a Muslim. 
And so I was doing that, but not knowing that I was doing that at that point. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much uh, uh, how, how I used apologetics, uh, both to defend uh, what I passionately believed and, and, and to defend the Ummah, which I had spent you know, countless hours studying and going to the masjid and listening to these scholars and participating uh, you know, in these various halaqa that they had at the masajid, traveling to Chicago to go to Isna year after year, you know, th this kind of thing. You know, I was defending that and learning simultaneously, and I think that that's a good thing. Sam, yeah, you, Sam, wanna, yeah, Sam, you said Sam, something. Sam had a question for you. Yeah, you said something that's quite interesting. <clears throat> you said that <clears throat> because Shibra Ali provided a response, <clears throat> you used that to justify believing in what you believe, irrespective of wh whether this response was valid or not. And you call that confirmation bias. Can you expound on that? Because I find that's common among Muslims. No matter how sure. bad, <clears throat> no matter how irrational, illogical res response may be, the simple fact that there is a response somehow justifies yeah. in their mind to continue to believe what they believe. Could you expound on that? Why is that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first, let, let me give some examples because David asked about you know what the debates did for me particularly. Like for example, when David Wood would bring certain uh, issues up, whether it was uh, you know Muhammad's marriage to Zainab, whether it was the satanic verses, whether it was the incident of Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar, and there was numerous examples like these that I was bombarded with that you know I had not thought about completely before. I had a basic foundation that Tawheed is true, uh, the, the spirituality in Islam is true, it's beautiful, it's aesthetic, it uplifts me, and that's why I, I need to defend this religion. And so what happened was when, when David would give, me those, would give me those arguments, I would purposely go to scholars and ask them and purposely look into the books and the materials and in the debates to find a response because, because I want Islam to be, to be true emotionally, uh, in terms of, of, of protecting my ego from, um, from anxiety, which is called the defense mechanism in, in uh, psychoanalytics. And so it was a defense mechanism. It was a, it was a confirmation bias that, that many human beings fall, fall to. And, and I was doing it, and so many other Muslims are doing it when it comes to these issues like Abdullah ibn Abi Sa'd, simply because th th there is a response. For example, I, I brought up, I've, since I've left Islam, I've brought up that incident of Abdullah ibn Abi Sar a few times. And, you know, I get Muslims who send me emails saying, look, the, here's the response from Islamic awareness or whatever. Yeah. As if, you know, simply because there's a response, you know, there, there's a reason why, how we can interpret this yes, to get away, as, to as, get around as if, as if you didn't look at this before. Right, exactly. And a matter of fact, I looked at it, the, the same material that they were giving me was what I, what I looked at in order to prepare for my debate for you. Um, and, and then li going back and listening to my debate with you, uh, you know, helped me, helped me think about the issue a little bit more, too, of how my, my personal response was not, was not the best, uh, was not a good legitimate response. Um, I, I have a question I'd like to ask you and CL because uh, you were a public debater when you were a Muslim. CL, uh, are your are your YouTube videos still up when you're a Muslim? Are yes. they still up? Yes, they're still yes. up. Yes. They're still yes. up. Um, what well, what I wanted to ask is because you talked about wanting to defend Islam against objection. Was it more? Uh, was your goal in debating more to defend Islam against criticisms, or was it more? offensive in that it, your, your goal is to actually convince other people of your view and, and, and what, we, what Christians would call evangelism. Are you, do, are you doing a kind of dawah, trying to show people that Islam is true, or did you just want people not to get bad information about Islam that was being spread by you know, people like me or Sam Shamoon? Can you hear us? You there? Can you hear us? Oh, you you're asking me, or you I thought you were asking me? No, that's yeah. you, I was, yeah. I, was, I, was asking, I was asking both of you, but <laughs> okay, you can go first. Head. Oh, no, no, okay, so, so in response to that, it, it, was, it was both. I was doing, uh, you have to understand, before I got involved in with, with, with you guys, with you and Nabil and Sam Shamoon and you guys, I was, I was debating and inviting uh, Ahmadis or Qadianis to Islam regularly. Mm -hmm. I was doing dawah, and I was actually, you know, frustrating the Ahmadis back then for, for the first uh, six years of my Muslim life or my Sunni Muslim life, and I was debating them, going to their masjid, debating my own family, inviting them to Sunni Islam. And so, so, so uh, when I found out that Nabil Qureshi had left uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmadiyya Islam 
for Christianity that invoked uh, a desire in me to start learning more and more about Christianity. I mean, as an Ahmadi, I had already, you know, because as Ahmadis and Nabil can confirm this, you know, uh, that we had to learn how to do tabligh to Christians too. So we had books like, you know, A Journey from Facts to Fiction, uh, Christianity and Islam by Mirza Tahir Ahmed, and we would read those books about Christianity, but they were very poor. They were like Ahmadi, Dad, Zakir Naik type, type arguments. And th those were the type of arguments that I was exposed to and used to at that point. And so I was doing uh, da'wah to Ahmadis, and, the, and then when I found out that Nabil had was baptized, this was an opportunity for me to, to delve more into Christianity and, and, and start to invite uh, Christians to, to, again, my source of brotherhood and spirituality and identity and that kind of thing. And so it was both. It was both an opportunity to learn and it was an opportunity to do da'wah. Uh, we want to uh, because that was so important. That was important, but we want to get back to uh, CL and Farhan. Uh, we haven't heard from Farhan in a little while, so Farhan, uh, I wanted to, to to get down to to some specific issues because you, you mentioned that leaving Islam was such uh, was such a major change, was such a you know a, a difficult step to make. Uh, what were if you had to list some of the main you know some of the main reasons? What would be some, kind of the big issues that pushed you over that, pushed that edge? Over that. I mean, I think, it, I think that it was a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the, the first and foremost reason was uh, due to my education in psychology and my pursuit in, for, in a career in mental health. I was, de I was dealing with a lot of people who, who, who are suffering. You know, people were self-mutilating, cutting themselves, suicidal ideation, uh, you know, all kinds of you know, mental and psychological disturbances. And so I saw a lot of suffering and I thought about them and I thought about a lot of, you know, just general humanity. Uh, and I thought about, you know, what Islam, uh, you know, says about them in general, that their lives are a waste because they're not, you know, bowing to Allah five times a day, saying stuff in Arabic and growing their beards and their women aren't wearing hijab, as if that is the purpose for why God <laughs> created them. You know what I mean? And on top of that, that their destiny is going to be, as chapter 4, verse 56 says, that their skin is going to be burned off and replaced with new skin yeah. uh, endlessly. An actual physical endless torture that they're, going, that they're going to go through. And I think it was a combination of putting all of that together uh, that opened up all of the other issues that, for example, that I've been reading about and, and even debating about with you, with you guys and other people, you know, stuff like Abdullah ibn Abi said and, and, and uh, you know, Zainab's marriage to, to, and the satanic verses and, you know, the list could go on and on about the controversial things about Muhammad ibn Abdullah uh, and, and, and his companions. But that was the big thing that, that, that came at me um, was, was understanding the intense indoctrination. Literally, it's one of it's probably the most intense and most disturbing indoctrination that that exists on our planet today, and it gets people to to, to act violently and viciously and oppress people and want to implement Sharia law. Mm. This is what that type of what this is what this type of indoctrination does. Even if you think that that we can reinterpret Islam, we can you know. Islam can 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 be reinterpreted in a peaceful way, where where we can focus on all of the positive verses. There is still a massive element there, and there's there, there's plenty of verses in ahadith to support it that get Muslims to do crazy things. And he, and I, everyone sees it. I mean, even the Muslims sees it. They just turn see it. They're just turning a blind eye to it because they're emotionally attached, like I was, you know, to their identity as a Muslim. And here's, and here's my, my, my message to the Muslims, is that, look, I, I understand that you're emotionally attached and, you, and that you have this love for your religion. But, but, but there is so much else that, about Islam that's detrimental to broader humanity and that, that, that there needs to be a movement uh, of, of people speaking against, against an idea that's very dangerous for society. And I didn't realize that until recently. And, 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 you know, to be liberated from it, from, from it I could only want that for, for, for so many. Even, you know, when I see, you know, when I see Muslims now, you know, as, as an apostate, I see these bearded guys and these women wearing the niqab. You know, before I used to be like, mashallah, you know, they're, 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 they're so much into the deen. I want me and my wife, my Sunni Muslim wife that I want, wanted, you know, I want to be like that. You know what I mean? And now when I see it, it, it breaks my heart. You know, even if they think, even if they convince themselves that this is, 
you know, that, that, that this is good for them. You know, even if they think that it's good for them, you know what I mean? It still breaks my heart to see them, th th them you know, being lured by, by, this, ideo by, by this ideology when, when they could be so much more of a human being than that. <clears throat> I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask a question to Farhan and then one for you. But Farhan, you kept mentioning Abdullah ibn Abisar. And you also mentioned the story of Zainab. Now, there are some people who may be tuning in for the first time, have no clue what you're talking about. In fact, as you are well aware, there are even a lot of Muslims who have no idea about the incident with Abdullah ibn Abisar as well as Zainab. Can you briefly touch on those two uh, incidents? Because those were some of the things that troubled you. What was it about <clears throat> Abdullah ibn Abisar that troubled you? And what was it about Zainab that troubled you? Could you elaborate briefly? And then I'll have a question for you about why... What troubled you enough to leave Islam? Mm -hmm. So, uh, sure, sure. Uh, and I brought up uh, <clears throat> the story of uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar before, and in, in, in other dialogues that I've had. And, and the reason why that one disturbs me the most um, is because he, he was receiving the revelation. You know, Muhammad ibn Abdullah was receiving, uh, you know, revelation from Allah. I think it was Surah Al Mu'minun, and and you know, and and Abdullah was able to you know add. You know, as he wanted to 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 the to the to the book of Allah, and, and that frustrated him to the point that he apostated from Islam, and then you know, and then a death sentence was was sent by Muhammad, uh, and and uh, you know, Uthman had to you know per, get get convince Muhammad not to kill him. In order to convince Muhammad not to kill him, they had to coerce him to convert back to Islam. I mean that was just it was altogether a disturbing story that you know that that really you know shook me you know when I actually did the research behind it um, and the story so of Zainab quickly, that was something that David would yeah, before you get okay. to Zainab real quickly so just so I can understand what you're saying and this is for the benefit of the audience you're telling me that this this gentleman named Abdullah ibn Abisar would actually change the messages that Muhammad claimed he was receiving from Allah which led to his apostasy because any sensible person would conclude like he did, wait, Muhammad, if you're telling me what you're writing down or asking me to write down are revelations from God, there is no way that I can influence you to change those revelations. Is that what happened? Yeah, he was actually adding to the verses. Like, for mm -hmm. example, Muhammad would finish, finish an ayah and Abdullah ibn Abi Sa'd would say that something that rhymes with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was profound. And Muhammad was like, "Yeah, go ahead and write that." Mm. Um, and um, it, 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 that, it, that, see, that, it seems that, that it seems of... that his reasoning it seems that his reasoning is is exactly parallel to the Muslim who who might think about the story today. In other words, if you're Abdullah, you're thinking, uh, "Wait a minute! If I mean, if this guy's a prophet, then I'm a prophet too because I'm saying things and and he's writing them down as revelations of the Quran." Um, but a Muslim today can, and he left Islam over that. He left Islam. He yeah, said, look, if, there's no way this guy's a prophet or I wouldn't be allowed to change his revelations, but I am allowed to change the revelations. And therefore this guy can't, this, this, this message can't be from God. But a Muslim can look at that exact and may, and have that exact same reasoning. That's Wait right. a minute. I believe the Quran is this perfect word of God. And yet there was a guy, one of Muhammad's scribes who could improve it. Yes, who can improve it? Muhammad says, yeah, write it, write it that way. Not inspired. Yeah. But what if someone tells, hold on, Farhan, well, that, those are fabricated stories. They're not based on authentic uh, Sunni sources. Now, I'm sure you've come, with, come up, uh, have met Muslims who've used that argument. So didn't you entertain that idea as you were studying that story? Didn't you think that maybe this, these are fraudulent tales and therefore they don't hold any weight as far as Sunni Islam is concerned? If so, then how did you deal with that? Well, I mean, I, I did think that I did think that for a while. And a matter of fact, I was finding ways and I was finding the typical arguments, you know, against that, that, that it was fabricated. This is not from an authentic source, um, you, you know, stuff, j j just a typical Muslim response. You know, I mean, th this is a typical response that Muslims give. You know, what, what you're saying is that, oh, th this is this is not fabricated and stuff like that. But there's so many stories like this about Muhammad that they consider fabricated. First of all, why do these fabrications even exist? Exactly. Second of all, I think David Wood made an excellent point 
when, when he debated Robert Spencer in terms of the principle of, embar of, of embarrassment. Why even narrate this in the first place? And then on top of that, you know, there's so many other incidents like the satanic versus, you know, is another perfect example of, uh, of this. Um, and, and it has like over 30, you know, chains of narration leading to it. You know what I mean? And why would people fabricate this? You know what I mean? About their beloved. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it, again, it took me, like I said, uh, to, to realize that Islam is not the ultimate reality behind our existence in order for everything else to start making sense. You know what I mean? Before, I had to have a reason and interpretation to get around it. I see. And, oh, and again, real quickly, what about Zainab? What was it about Zainab that showed me? Because you mentioned Zainab, the story of Zainab. What is that all about? Well, David, I, I think, in two of our debates brought her up. And, you know, I, I, I found myself, you know, desperately trying to say that, oh, Muhammad was a man, you know, he got aroused when he saw her and, you know, and, and stuff like that. That's natural. That, that, that's, the, that's the type of, you know, arguments um, that, that I had in my mind. You know what I mean? There's a reason why, as a, as a he was still a human being, he was an angel, and so he naturally had these inclinations. But, okay, even if he did, you know what I mean? You have to be the better man mm -hmm. than, than to try to get your own uh, adopted son's daughter. You know what I mean? There, there, has, you, there, there, has to be, there has to be a bigger morality there. That even if Allah revealed to you that, that you could have her, you should still be the better man and, and say, no, this is my adopted son's daughter, dude. I got to chill out on that. And, and it didn't happen that way. And, and you know, I, I, I just think that, 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 that the story is just not, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sen any sense to me. Yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> so, so basically, these are stories that you concluded that couldn't be fabrications because if they're fabricated, why would anyone create such stories making Muhammad look so bad? So it had to have the ring of truth. And if that's the case, then how could Muhammad be a prophet? Now, that's what led you to your eventual apostasy. And I don't know if we have to come up in a break, if we do. But I'd like you to tell, share with the audience what were some of the reasons that led you to question Islam which eventually led to your apostasy. Now, your, your story is somewhat different from, from, from uh, for, for Han, in that although both of you left Islam, one of you came to the Christian faith. You're now a devout Christian, whereas for Han, uh, again, for Han, could you, could you give us an idea of what your beliefs are? Because uh, I don't want to misrepresent you. I don't want to say you're a Hindu or a New Ager. I'd, what, what do you believe yeah, now, where, right now? Where are you at now, for Han? Yes, on your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. uh, to, in order to state my beliefs, I always say, say, say the same thing. I am an agnostic theist, which means I don't know what the ultimate reality behind our existence is, but I am a theist. I am a believer in God, um, and I'm open to the possibilities, and I open up my imagination to the possibilities. I do not firmly uh, 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 argue for uh, any any particular truth claim that's out there, but I but but I but I try to imagine and be be creative in terms of thinking about what the possibilities are, and so that's pretty much where I am. And I thought about a lot of different possibilities. I'm constantly praying. I just talked to Dr. Um, uh, Corbin of of YogaDangers.com for full four hours yes uh, two days ago. I talk, I've been talking to Shreve Ministries, Michael Shreve, who's who's written uh, you know who went through Hinduism. Um, uh, it, it was actually Sikhism, and he was doing Kundalini Yoga. He, he, I talked to him for a couple hours, and we prayed together, and he sent me his book. So I have a, po a lot of positive relationships with Christian miss uh, missionaries that are out there. I, I love the story of Jesus. You know, the, 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 sh the name of the show is Jesus or Muhammad. Um, I still think that there are certain things that Muhammad said and did that, were, that, 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 could, that people can focus on, that certain Muslims do focus on and can get good things from them. But I do think that... that, that, that very broadly, the story, the story of Jesus is more inspiring, more spiritual, uh, and it resonates more w with me spiritually than, the, than some of the rigidness experienced there in Muhammad's life. Uh, so if I were to choose one, I would say Jesus definitely speaks to me more. Um, but I, right, but, but right. right now, I would say I'm firmly, I'm firmly an agnostic theist. Yes. Well, you know what, Farhan, we're going to ask all of our audience that are watching this program who are committed Christians, to continue to pray for you for your journey because we we are convinced and I know this may sound like well because you know we're Christian fanatics but we are convinced that Jesus is risen 
He is alive. And that if you open your heart and seek him, he will reveal himself to you eventually in his time. And we believe that there will be a day in which you'll be.